Hello and welcome back to our second video lecture for week one of CS631 Advanced Programming in the Unix Environment. In our first segment we discussed all the what, why and how of the class. We introduced the course syllabus and I warned you about all the code you'd have to write for this course. In this segment we'll briefly review the history of the Unix operating system. There will be intrigue, lawsuits, differences of opinions and one or two holy wars, although we'll leave the most sensitive political battle BI versus Emacs, unaddressed so as not to offend anyone. <coughs> <The I. coughs> the Unix operating systems family has come a long way from a test platform for Ken Thompson's space travel game running on a PDP-7 to the most widely used server operating system. Its history begins at AT&T Bell Labs in New Jersey, where Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson, shown here working on the PDP-11, worked together with Doug McGilroy and Joe Asana in a replacement for the Multics operating system. The C programming language was developed in parallel by Dennis Ritchie for and on Unix, deriving from the B programming language developed by Ken Thompson for the new OS they built. Dennis Ritchie describes the history of the language and the operating system at the link shown here in the slides. Eventually, sometime around 1973 or so, Unix itself was rewritten in C and Wait a second, if it was rewritten, then what was it originally written in? The answer is that early on, Unix was written in assembly for the specific target platform and hardware. And only as Ken Thompson and as Ritchie developed C as a systems programming language, did they then decide to rewrite the OS to take advantage of this new high-level programming language. This way, the operating system became portable, meaning it was no longer tied to the hardware in question and could be recompiled for other platforms. In 1975, Con Thompson was on sabbatical from Bell Labs and went to the University of California in Berkeley as a visiting professor. Since its parent company, AT&T, was prohibited from selling the operating system, the laboratories licensed it, together with a complete source code, to academic institutions and commercial entities. This, one might argue, ultimately led directly to the very notion of open source. In the Computer Systems Research Group, or CSRG, at UC Berkeley extended the operating system with their patch sets. Graduate students Chuck Haley and Bill Joy, who in 1982 would go on to co-found some microsystems, added new tools and other software and eventually began distributing these as the Berkeley Software Distribution, or BSD. During that time, two main lineages of Unix developed, the BSD-derived or influence systems as well as those deriving from what became System 5 of Unix, one of the first commercial versions of the OS. As development on the different operating systems continued, the folks over at Berkeley added the TCP-IP stack funded by the DARPA Research Grant. This stack is still the de facto standard implementation of TCP-IP and can be found in a number of other operating systems. In the meantime, a company called BSDI began selling their version of Unix based on the Berkeley software distribution called it BSDOS and branding it as Unix. They even had a telephone hotline called 1-800-IT'S-UNIX. Now Bell Labs had licensed the OS and the source code to Berkeley, but BSDI was selling a product derived from this code and was su subsequently sued by Unix Systems Laboratories, USL, a subsidiary of AT&T Bell Labs at that time. Now BSDI claimed that they could not possibly be at fault because they got their code from UC Berkeley. And so USL said, cool beans, we'll sue UC Berkeley as well. But now things got interesting. The BSD patches had always been licensed under the so-called BSD license, which in a nutshell said, you can do whatever you want with this code, including selling it as closed source, but you need to give us credit. Just say your product includes code developed by us and everything's peachy. Sounds pretty simple, right? And the BSD patches included so much cool stuff. You had TCP IP, NFS, VI, and much, much more. Many of the commercial Unix providers at the time had by then incorporated these patches, as had USL in the product that they then licensed and sold. Only USL appears to have forgotten to include in their copyright notices the disclaimer that the code did originate 
at least in part, from BSD, which according to the license term, they were obligated to do. So UC Berkeley, ever the spunky Californians, when threatened with a lawsuit, said, you know what, we're suing you. After some time then, the case was settled. UC Berkeley could re would rewrite the bits that were encumbered by the old AT&T license, leading to a code base without any proprietary code known as 4.4 BSD Lite. At this point in time, there were about six files that still retained encumbered code out of 18,000 files or so. So eventually that was rewritten and the 4.4 BSD Lite release of BSD became the new unencumbered version. At this time, there had already been born two descendants of BSD. NetBSD was first released in March of 1993 with a focus on portability and technical correctness, and FreeBSD first released in December of 1993 with a focus on the new i386 platform. Meanwhile, over in Finland, a young computer science student named Linus Torvalds had been playing around with Minix, a Unix-like operating system created by Andrew Tannenbaum, and he had just finished his own OS kernel, termed Linux, which he released on the internet in 1991. Linus had chosen the GNU public license for his kernel. This license originated from the GNU's Not Unix project, an effort created in the early 80s by Richard Stallman at MIT to develop a completely free Unix-like operating system. The GNU project had written a compiler, an editor, Emacs of course, various utilities and all the other things, but they had been lacking a kernel up until now. An operating system without a kernel is not really an operating system, just like a kernel without the remainder of the operating system is not an operating system either. So the announcement of the Linux kernel under the GPL allowed the GNU project to create, finally, a complete operating system, GNU slash Linux, which is in fact the correct name for the operating system that nowadays everybody and their brother and sister everywhere refers to as just Linux. Now in contrast to the BSD license, the GPL provided additional restrictions on the recipient of the software. This seems counterintuitive in that it was a free software license, but it did add a restriction, an important one. That is, you are free to use the code in any way you saw fit. But if you made any changes to the code, those changes had to be released under the same terms, those of the GPL. That is in contrast to the BSD license, which merely states you can do whatever you want, including make modifications, keep those modifications to yourself, and then sell the resulting product, so long as you acknowledge where this code, the original code came from. The birth of this new operating system, GNU Linux, despite a more restrictive license that normally might make businesses hesitant to adopt, at the time that the USL versus UC Berkeley slash BSDI lawsuit was ongoing, may have directly led to broader adoption of Linux over the BSD variants and possibly caused Linux's market dominance nowadays. Of course, we don't know for sure, since we can't go back in history and evaluate what, what ifs at that time. But be that as it may, throughout the 90s and early 2000s, many of the commercial Unix versions lost market share. The number of interesting developments continue to, um, onwards from there. You'll see over here in the slides a whole bunch of them listed by year, several items that may be of interest. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list. The Darwin operating system, for example, was derived from Next using the Mac microkernel with code from the user land coming from Free and NetBSD. It was born around 2000. This, of course, is no surprise in that Steve Jobs, who had left Apple and then worked for Next, had been using this kernel and upon his return to Apple, began working on this operating system that would later on develop into Mac OS X. Solaris, the operating system that followed Sun Microsystem SunOS um, after merging a number of BSD patches and a number of System 5 derived features, developed a number of other groundbreaking, groundbreaking features, including ZFS, a very advanced file system with novel ideas, DTrace, and containers, when at that time containerization was really not yet widespread, widespread use. 
Android Linux variant and iOS, effectively a version of Darwin and thus BSD der uh, derived, ended up on our mobile devices. So throughout the last 50 years, we've seen a perhaps surprising number of Unix systems. Some of them are all caps Unix systems, which derive directly from the AT&T code. Some are trademark Unix versions, meaning they have undergone certification to meet the Unix specification. This trademark certification is expensive, so not many companies would do that. And every time you make a change, you would have to undergo the same certification again. Therefore, a number of operating systems providers, and especially open source projects, would not undergo the certification and not become a trademark Unix, even if they are a so-called genetic Unix. And then there are so-called Unix-like operating systems, meaning those are operating systems that share no lineage or code, but they look and behave just like a Unix system. So on this slide, you see basically a small selection of Unix systems, which I'm primarily showing to remind people that there are more Unix flavors than merely Linux. The interesting thing is that even though these different variations of Unix do behave by and large in the same way. Meaning, if you are able to use one operating system, you should be able to quickly and easily adapt to the other. And if you could write code for one operating system, you should be able to quickly adapt your code for the others. And again, the difference to Linux here is that all of these are separate operating systems, while all the different Linux distributions that we see are just that, Linux distributions, versions of packaging Linux. But realistically, out there in the so-called mystical real world that we occasionally refer to, you will only come upon a shorter number of all these different operating systems. So over here is a list that derives them and that groups them together, primarily under Linux, BSD, and other, even though, as you can tell, the other category has overlapped with the first two. So it's important again to note that Linux is a one Unix-like operating system which just happens to come in a surprisingly large number of distributions, whereby different projects or companies have bundled different pieces of software together. One company may add a web server or a database server, another company may focus on desktop usage and still pick and patch together the same pieces, the kernel and other libraries and tools, bundle them together perhaps offer support and call it a distribution. This is notably different from the other operating systems, which remain whole units and cannot be split up or recombined. We do not have a number of distributions of NetBSD. There's only one NetBSD. We do not have a number of variations of FreeBSD, OpenBSD or DragonflyBSD. Those are all coherent units that are one and the same. Now, the market share for commercial Unix platforms outside of Linux, the BSDs, and the mobile platforms has increasingly shrunk over the last few years. So you are unlikely to encounter the range of operating system variants I showed in the previous slide. But nevertheless, some of them are still out there working hard. Now, our reference platform for this class is NetBSD. NetBSD, then, is a direct, true, genetic Unix even though it does not hold the Unix trademark. The open source NetBSD Foundation does not have the monetary resources to undergo a certification for their product every time they make a new release. But as a whole operating system, it provides not just a kernel, but system libraries and user end utilities that all are developed together and provide a coherent self and a coherent entire OS image. Being a complete operating system, it also includes some additional information, such as a summary of the Unix history as it relates to the BSDs. You can find this history under user share misc, and it may be fun for you to browse through this tree. As you can see, we have here the shortened version of the Unix history as we just rehashed by identifying the different lineages and showing release dates as they correlate between the different BSD variants. If 
we scroll through here, we identify how Dragonfly splits off FreeBSD, we saw earlier OpenBSD splitting off NetBSD, and then we move forwards through time as the different releases are made. Towards the end of the file, we then have an itemized list of all the release dates for the different versions, including additional history information about the different branches and the operating systems. And it may be useful for you to just poke around and see where all these things end up. But to really understand how widely used, how diverse the term Unix is, let's have a look at the complete family tree here. We see the timeline of most Unix versions as they split off the original systems from their ROMs. As we scroll to the right, we can see the birth of the Berkeley software distribution with its various releases alongside several commercial Unix distributions. Over here, in 1984, we see Minix being born. Down at the bottom, splitting off of the initial Unix versions. And as we progress through the mid 80s, you will notice that there's a lot of variation, a lot of code flowing back and forth between the different operating systems. Notably, most OS vendors are importing the BSD patch sets to get all the features developed in Berkeley. Now over here, in 1991, we see the birth of the Linux kernel, branching off of the Minix timeline. In 1993, we see the first appearance of NetBSD, followed soon after by the birth of FreeBSD in December of the same year. Disagreements within the NetBSD developer group leads to the fork of OpenBSD of the NetBSD timeline in 1995. In the late 90s, Apple begins developing Mac OS X or Mac OS X, which is officially released for consumer products around 2001. Mac OS X server was released before that. Now, as we scroll through the early 2000s, the time that doesn't feel all that long ago to me, but that I guess by now actually is, we notice that there's distinctly less cross-pollination between the different operating systems, and fewer commercial versions appear to have survived. In 2008, Android appears, a Linux version for mobile devices while Apple's iPhone OS later becomes iOS, as we all know. You see it over here in the timeline, developing first as iPhone OS, then becoming iOS. We notice some code sharing in parts based on the liberal BSD license, as we see over here, that BSD code flowing into a few other products such as the recent Minix release around 2012, and FreeBSD feeding back into different products such as JunoS and PCBSD and other products. But as we are catching up with 2019 and 2020, we are left with but a handful of popular Unix versions. The final releases that we see over here remain NetBSD, FreeBSD, then we have macOS, we have OpenSolaris, we have Linux, of course, Android, HPOX, but that is about it, which is a sparse field compared to what it looked like in the 80s. Now, lest you think the lineage of Linux by itself is any less nuts, here's a quick look at how the different Linux distributions developed over time. It looks just as bonkers as the regular Unix timeline graph, doesn't it? We identify a few major lineages here as well. There's Debian, which, as we follow this brownish line over to the right, leads to Ubuntu and all its variants. We see a number of short-lived projects. 
Before we take a look at Slackware Linux, one of the oldest distributions alongside Debian, which then also develops or forks off the SUSE variant of Linux. At the bottom of our graphic, we see Red Hat Linux, which nowadays enjoys significant popularity in the server market. Anyway, as we've seen, the history of Unix and Linux as one version of Unix-like operating systems is diverse. It is no surprise then that nowadays we find Unix just about everywhere. Unix runs on your desktop, your laptop, your servers. It powers the public clouds provided by Amazon and Google. It runs on your TV, your phone, your watch, your stereo, your car navigation system, meaning you may at times have to pull over off the road to install a software update, your thermostat, your refrigerator, your toaster, etc. etc. This is not only fascinating, but it also has a number of implications. On the one hand, and this is why this class is particularly relevant and hopefully of interest to you, it means that if you understand Unix, you will be better able to understand how all of these things work. On the other hand, this also means that your fridge now has a CVE and that your thermostat runs a web server that can be hacked. You're running a general purpose operating system on the Internet of Things without much consideration for how to manage these systems. But do take a look at the printed manuals of some of your devices. I'm sure you will find a number of copyright disclaimers in them saying this product includes software derived from software contributed to Berkeley by or this product includes software written by the regents of the University of California or something similar. It's a world full of Unix. Unix everywhere. Okay, phew. This concludes our brief history of the Unix operating system. In our next segment, we'll take a closer look at the features and properties of the system, of the features of the C programming language, and we'll discuss the Unix program design philosophy. We'll also finally get to write some code as we explore these features, so please make sure to keep your eyes open for the next video lecture. Until next time, cheers!